Good afternoon. My name is Dean Godson. I have the pleasure of being your host uh, today uh, for this uh, most important uh, event with Dr. Moeed Yusuf, National Security Advisor to Prime Minister of Pakistan, the importance of uh, Pakistan in current uh, regional discussions and crisis is too obvious uh, for me to need to enumerate at any length. We always like to uh, bring you events of the utmost relevance uh, and importance, and I believe that this event with uh, Dr. Yusuf, who's come in at short notice, uh, very much fits into that category. He's going to speak for 20 minutes, then very kindly agreed to answer questions. If I could ask the distinguished audience, please kindly to put up their electronic hands uh, at your earliest convenience, so that can have uh, some sense of uh, the range of questioners and questions that may be asked. And uh, if I have to disappoint anyone, my apologies, because I know there'll be many people wanting uh, to come in and discuss. So, Dr. Sif, thank you again for coming at this uh, notice. Very much look forward to hearing what you have to say. Over to you. Thank you. Thank you, Lord Godson. Thank you um, to the Institute uh, for uh, having me here. Uh, when uh, you invited me, I, I made it a point uh, to take time, given the importance of the uh, situation in Afghanistan and uh, our common interests on where we want to go. Um, but I speak to you today more as a scholar, frankly, than as uh, the National Security Advisor, because I think it's crucial to put this Afghanistan uh, issue in the right analytical frame. So let me start um, by talking about that a little bit. I'm going to focus on the present and future, but I, I think it's, it's important to understand why we are where we are. So just to rush through that, uh, I can't but start from the 1980s when Pakistan and the Western world, including the UK, uh, partnered in the war in Afghanistan against the Soviet Union. Pakistan was the frontline ally at the time, uh, worked with the West for 10 years, only to see uh, the world abandon Afghanistan and sanction Pakistan, uh, literally the day after uh, that conversation ended uh, in the 80s. The result was a civil war in Afghanistan. The result was over three to four million refugees in Pakistan, and I, I might, um, remind the audience that we still have um, over 3 million uh, Afghans in Pakistan uh, as we speak. No other country has been more generous in this regard. Be that as it may, the abandonment of the region left a security vacuum. The security vacuum that was filled by Al-Qaeda and other terrorist organizations, uh, which then culminated in the very, very sad and deplorable events of 9-11. Post 9-11, there was an overnight change, as we all know. Uh, the US uh, and NATO forces, the ISAF forces, essentially at the end of the day, uh, there was a military campaign. Overnight, the conversation shifted. Uh, Pakistan was a partner again. Pakistan worked with the Western world and the US. And the US and others acknowledge that there was no other country that did more than Pakistan had done to weed out Al-Qaeda uh, and to fight other uh, terrorist groups. Mind you, neither did Pakistan have anything to do with 9-11, nor were these people in Pakistan before the military campaign began. These people crossed over because of the military campaign uh, from a border that has been porous for, for years and years, for decades, where even today, 20 to 25,000 people cross every single day and then go back. Simply, uh, it, was, it was so porous that there was no way to know what would happen. In any case, Pakistan's effort with the Western world in the war on terror directly brought, brought about a backlash from militant groups who then started targeting the Pakistani state and today, Pakistan has lost 80,000 people in terms of casualties, $150 billion in economic, uh, in terms of the economic loss, and over 2 million people internally displaced. So when we talk about refugees, when we talk about deaths, when we talk about losses, uh, Pakistanis do ask this question, why are we glossed over? 
uh, were our lives not as important? Was our partnership not valued? Because what we have heard after all of this, unfortunately, has been do more. You haven't done enough. How many more lives is what Pakistanis ask? Um, let me also say that when we talk about refugees, and I've told you three to four million refugees, just compare this with other countries. Compare this with the discussion in other countries, uh, and please uh, imagine what Pakistan would have had to do in the past three to four decades uh, to house our Afghan brothers and sisters. We've done it, we continue to do it, uh, but uh, I think it needs to be recognized when people talk about a fresh refugee wave, uh, that Pakistan can't simply be uh, a place where everybody uh, decides that it's uh, free for all and anybody and uh, everybody can, uh, can see this as a right uh, that Pakistan should house people. I think it's an international community um, uh, that, that is responsible at the end of the day. In any case, let me also address, because this question I know will come up, oh, Pakistan uh, supported the Taliban. What was the allegation? The allegation was that people were crossing over from Pakistan into Afghanistan uh, to support the Taliban. So let me say two things. First of all, we have repeatedly said that Afghan refugee camps, we're talking of millions of people, camps as big as half a million in, uh, in some places. Those are the places where these 20, 25,000 people who cross over, some of them go and melt away in the refugee camps. Now, in half a million people, you're asking me to tell, tell you every single person, it is not possible for any state. And that is why we constantly ask the world, the situation is Im improving in Afghanistan. The world says there is a government, there's governance, there's money. Why not take these people back? Who is going to take, who's going to ensure a dignified return of Afghan refugees? We got no response. Um, if that was the problem, if Pakistan's uh, crossing over from Pakistan was a problem. Why wasn't there any movement on that? Next, in 2011-12, we offered Afghanistan joint border management. No response till this day, uh, 10 years later. We started implementing biometrics uh, on the border. The Afghans refused and those machines were broken down. More recently, we have fenced 97% and the rest of the 3% will be done soon off our border with Afghanistan to ensure that there is no crossing. We got opposition from Afghanistan. Nobody supported us. We had to spend our own money on it. We have said, stop this business of 20,000 people crossing over just on ID cards. We should go to a formal visa regime like any country in the world would have with another country. There is strong opposition has been from Afghanistan. We said, let's formalize the border crossing so both of us can see who's coming and who's going. The answer was no. So I want to ask, whose sincerity should I doubt? The Pakistan that is saying, if you think there is a problem, let's man this border and jointly observe it. Or the country that kept blaming Pakistan but did not want to do a thing. The government of President Ashraf Ghani did not want to do a thing to stem whatever he thought was happening. And I'll tell you why because the real flow was of terrorists coming from Afghanistan into Pakistan. That's the conversation they did not want to entertain. And I'm sorry to say that the global narrative just went along with them, uh, blaming Pakistan, when really Pakistan has been the victim of the war in Afghanistan for the past four decades. Lives lost, terrorism, refugees, everything that I've told you. In any case, let me also say, that Pakistan is the only country that has been speaking the truth for the past 20 years. It was difficult to absorb. We were shunned away, but it has been proven right today. What were we saying? Only a political settlement is possible. Do not try and manufacture a military uh, solution in a uh, context of Afghanistan. Nobody has been able to do it. It will not work. Uh, the, the allies, the uh, international forces wanted to go for total victory. We kept saying the government, its legitimacy is challenged. Afghans don't take it as legitimate. They live in a bubble. They don't have the pulse of the people. They are corrupt. We were told, no, this is what we've invested in. It is all good. We kept saying, now American officials are writing books saying that Pakistan back in 2010 said, this army cannot stand up the way you are doing it. It's ethnically disproportionate. You can't stand up an army that will fight in 10 years. 
revisit your model. We were told, no, this is where we are going. In fact, um, we were then asked to engineer a political settlement. We tried whatever we could. The Doha process started. We were given credit for it, and we were told to leave the room. There is a misconception that somehow Pakistan was involved in the negotiations. It was the US and the Taliban that agreed to a deal. We were not in the room. We were not told. It was the US that was talking to the President Ashraf Ghani government along with other Western countries. We were not involved. We were never asked when the deadlines were agreed to for the troop withdrawal. This is something that the statements coming out of UK officials and Pakistan, we agree on. Uh, because at the end of the day, we were talking about a responsible withdrawal, which meant political settlement before the withdrawal. Unfortunately, uh, what has happened, we were not uh, asked at all. To the contrary, what was the popular narrative? The popular narrative, unfortunately, throughout was, oh, Pakistan is the problem. The army will fight. President Ghani met Prime Minister Imran Khan. I was present in the meeting in Uzbekistan literally a month ago and said, we will fight to the last soldier. Uh, we have democracy. People stand behind us. Uh, this was the mantra that we've been hearing for years. I want to ask everybody what went wrong. Who was lying to the Western taxpayers about the reality? Was it Pakistan? Or was it this popular narrative that was created by elements in Afghanistan? Today we know, we are not saying this, international media is reporting that President Ghani, uh, the palace had 170 people whose job was to create fake trends on social media to malign Pakistan. Allow me to also say, our Eastern neighbor India played a very negative role. Continued to tell the world uh, through fake media campaigns, the EU Disinfo Lab, not Pakistan, the EU Disinfo Lab, a reputed organization last year put out a report. 114 countries, over 750 fake websites. India had set up to do one thing, malign Pakistan globally. But forget about that. What I want to mention here is, this is why the entire focus remained on a non-issue, and the real problems on the ground of corruption, of lack of trust, of the army not being able to stand up were completely ignored. They were all positive stories coming when Pakistan kept saying, please look at Afghanistan. This is not going to go in the right direction. What is the result? An embarrassment for everybody, a capitulation of the Afghan army, no will to fight. Uh, President Ghani fleeing away, um, talking differently and doing different things. Um, why did no Afghans stand up? This wasn't because of Pakistan. Pakistan did not tell the Afghan army not to fight. Pakistan did not tell President Ghani to leave. The Taliban took over the north and west of the country much before the south and east fell. How could Pakistan have anything to do with the north and west of Afghanistan bordering Iran and the Central Asian republics? So I really do think that the world should now stand up and say, we will learn lessons. There has been something that's gone horribly wrong, and we will learn lessons. We will not try and find a scapegoat, which unfortunately I still see attempts being made um, in, in some media uh, outlets in the West. Let me come to where we are. Number one, the best case scenario would have been if President Ashraf Ghani and the Taliban would have agreed to a political settlement. That's gone now. The worst case has also been avo uh, avoided, thankfully, which was if there was a protracted conflict on the ground and spillover of instability into the neighboring countries. But now is the challenge. We have a reality on the ground. Taliban are control in control of 95% of Afghanistan. Their initial statements, uh, I don't have to say this, but I'm only co quoting General Nick Carter, who said that we are cooperating with the Taliban on the ground. There seems to be a very straightforward relationship. The Taliban are cooperating. Uh, we need to be patient, give them space. Taliban, we may well, uh, there may well be a Taliban that is more reasonable, um, uh, etc. So General Carter is, is saying, let's try and see what could be done. And Pakistan's message is exactly the message of the UK and others. There should be an inclusive government. There should be rights protected. There should be a moderate governance model. This is where we need to engage as the international community. Let me come to what I really think is the message I want to leave everybody with. 
In the 1990s, a major mistake was made by abandoning the region. Everybody from former U.S. President Bush to Secretary of State Hillary Clinton to U.K. leaders were on record saying, we will never make this mistake again, otherwise we'll have to live with the consequences. And that is exactly what we need to remember. Today, we need to have a coordinated, concerted effort as an international community to engage for the sake of the average Afghan who is going to be left, who is already drought stricken, who does not have enough food. By the way, not today, but even under the previous regime, this was true. The message going to the average Afghan, the 30 to 40 million Afghans is who we owe it to, who the Western international community that spent 20 years in Afghanistan must not abandon now. Pakistan cannot bear the brunt of more refugees. Pakistan has faced enough spillover in the past. So it is very sad to see when the conversation again goes into, uh, oh, well, cannot be worked out. Uh, the world should now uh, leave, uh, should teach uh, the Taliban a lesson. Well, think about the Afghans on the ground. We are talking about evacuation. It is critical. Let me also tell you, by the way, that Pakistan is evacuated over 7,000 uh, internationals and their associates. 18 countries, 18 country nationals, our own airline has stopped internal aviation and has gone and evacuated people. More than 25 uh, female journalists were evacuated in less than 24 hours. No other country is doing more to evacuate Afghans. But, ladies and gentlemen, let me leave you with this. We cannot signal to the Afghans that the only ones who matter are the ones who were fortunate enough to be associated <clears throat> with Western and international organizations. If today the world makes the mistake of the 90s, I want to be categorical. The results cannot be better than last time. If we again find the easy path of saying we are done and out of here, the international legitimacy of the Western world would disappear in one second. We will have a humanitarian crisis, we will have instability, and we will have a security vacuum that terrorists may fill, targeting again um, Pakistan first and the Western world uh, second. We, Pakistan is in a position to help. We will do whatever we can. We are doing with evacuation, we will do with engagement, we will do with counterterrorism cooperation, but excellencies, it cannot be that Pakistan is demeaned in the same breath as we are requested for assistance. Pakistan's uh, sacrifices, Pakistan's efforts must be recognized. And this new wave of trying to scapegoat Pakistan saying, oh, um, you know, there is Pakistan and Pakistan is unstable. Pakistan is not unstable. Afghans are not refugees today. So let's please not create a narrative which says, oh, it's inevitable. Afghans will be refugees and Pakistan will take them. These are humans, not commodities. The international community spent 20 years there. We owe it to them to make sure, and the world owes it to Pakistan. Let me take the liberty not to repeat the mistakes of the 90s. Our job is to prevent a humanitarian crisis, not to talk about that being inevitable. So let's come together. Let's find a way to go forward. But please do remember, I do not, I make this point in, in earnest, that we cannot give an impression to Afghans and to Pakistan uh, that this is done and we will again turn our back. Who lost when we turned our back? Afghans lost, Pakistan lost, and the entire world lost um, at 9-11 and beyond. So let's learn collectively from what has happened and do the right thing by Afghans, and more importantly, by Pakistan, because nobody else, nobody else could have done what Pakistan has done to help, and nobody else is better placed uh, to continue that in partnership with the world. Uh, we cannot be alone because we are a responsible actor, and the international community must take ownership. Military withdrawal has happened. Now we need to engage even more politically and economically. My last line, there is no economic plan for Afghanistan that we have. Unless we come together to create that, how is the average Afghan going to survive? That's a question we must implore on, and that's a question that must uh, keep us awake at night. Thank you very much. Thank you.
as a doctor, uh, Yusuf has kind of agreed to answer questions. I, I could urge you all to put your electronic hands up so we can get a full flavor of the range uh, and identity of questioners. I see first uh, hand up uh, Right Honourable Marquis of Salisbury, former leader of House of Lords. Lord Salisbury, can you hear me? I, I, I can, Dean. Can you hear me? Hear you loud and clear. Thank you. Please fire away. Uh, Dr. Yusuf, uh, it's many years since I've been to your beautiful country. The last time was in 1989, uh, having spent nearly 10 years uh, uh, involved in the Soviet-Afghan war in a very peripheral capacity. Uh, and I uh, can testify then to the hospitality that your country gave to millions of refugees. I also think that you are right when you say that um, it was a great mistake not to have a, um, an interim government in place for when the Soviets left. And indeed, um, uh, President Zia uh, asked me to go and talk to Mrs. Thatcher and President Reagan, accompanied by Sir Hapsada Yaqub Khan, his then foreign minister, to try and persuade them of that. But I also have to say that I do have a question about how unified the agencies of the Pakistani government were then, and whether they are any more unified today. Back in the 1980s under President Zia, there was an almost unspoken agreement that the ISI had a pretty free reign in Afghanistan. I think that deal uh, uh, was, and that was in exchange for their not interfering internally in Pakistani affairs. Uh, we know what happened to President Zia and to Ambassador Rafael I was lucky not to be on that flight. Uh, we know equally today that the relationship between the ISI and the Taliban is a close one, and that Pakistani special forces have been active on the ground recently. So the question I have for you is uh, how united in uh, the line that you've taken with us today are the agencies of the uh, Pakistani government? Do the ISI get clearance from the political leadership, including yourself, uh, uh, the political leadership in Pakistan for their operations in Afghanistan? And if I may, if the answer to that is yes, how does this happen? And um, have you your, yourself been engaged in such giving such authority? Thank you. Lord Robson, may I respond? Please, you want to take please go away? ahead. Please go ahead. Okay. Uh, thank you, sir. Um, one, I want to invite you back so that you can see the new Pakistan and see uh, where we are today. Look, the 1980s was a very peculiar uh, circumstance in which the arrangement made was made collectively by the US, UK, essentially the quote-unquote free world, and Pakistan. So this is not the ISI uh, going about doing something. It was a collective effort at that time. Much has been written about it. Today, uh, I must tell you that uh, with, with respect, uh, I've never heard anybody talk about special forces in Afghanistan. Pakistan does not operate in Afghanistan. Afghanistan operates in Afghanistan. Two trillion dollars were spent to set up 400,000 people and a very powerful intelligence agency that unfortunately spent more time targeting Pakistan than worrying about their own country. Um, to say that Pakistan uh, was there and operating with all these forces present, um, I, I'm sorry, but it, it's just not logical. Um, second, close relationship. Let me explain. These people, uh, the, the Taliban, were born in refugee camps. We didn't create refugees. We didn't want 3 million refugees in our country. So yes, they grew up here. They have cultural and ethnic links, Afghans and Pakistanis. Uh, they lived as refugees here, yeah? as did millions of other Afghans, uh, including, by the way, uh, many senior officials in, uh, of the previous uh, President Ashraf Ghani government. But you know better than me if you follow this region. They didn't listen to us in the 90s when we were only one of the three countries that had recognized them. The Taliban, as soon as they captured the border post in Pakistan this time, said we will close the border if Pakistan... Um, wants a visa regime for Afghans, we will not accept it. And they didn't accept it. Uh, so, you know, this idea that Pakistan can somehow um, go beyond leverage. Today, tell me honestly, 
Did Pakistan give them legitimacy or did the US president talking to them in Doha and telling them, I'll call you to Camp David, give them legitimacy? Uh, uh, General Carter is saying that they're directly linked, uh, talking to the Taliban all the time. President Biden has said this. The leverage is with the Western world because it's you who have the money to support the Afghan um, entity, whichever it is, the government that comes about, not Pakistan. So I think this is dated and this is very uh, unfair, frankly, uh, when it comes to this conversation. Finally, on the ISI and the uh, Pakistani military. You have, sir, sitting in front of you, Pakistan's national security advisor. No political, no military, no bureaucratic background. I spent uh, 17 years of the past 25 years in the United States working for um, uh, a th in the think tank world, uh, teaching at Harvard and Boston University. Why am I sitting here? If the establishment was in such control, would somebody like me, whose background is in strategic thinking, be sitting here? Would a prime minister be in office who takes independent decisions? So let me just tell you, we work as a democratic government would. We take help whenever we need within our constitutional powers from the military and the ISI, and every single thing flows from the civilian government. The problem for many who don't like uh, Pakistan moving in the right direction, uh, of course, not talking about this audience, but generally, is that the civil military uh, coordination is unprecedented. So we speak with the same voice. But there is no question uh, on who's in command, and that's the Prime Minister of Pakistan. Lord Salisbury, did you want to come back there? Lord Godson, I can't hear you, sorry. Lord Salisbury, did you want to come back there? No? OK, next question. Tobias Elwood, MP, Chair of the Commons Defence Select Committee. Tobias, can you hear me? Let me just, I can hear you loud and clear, Dean. Thank you so much for organising this. Dr. Yusuf, thank you for your time as well. A fascinating uh, discussion. Uh, I just want to cl uh, clarify General Carter's comments because I think they may be taken out of context. He is required to talk to the Taliban because we require uh, communications to make the airport evacuation work. Uh, he doesn't speak for the political side, he speaks for the military operation. So I just ask you uh, humbly, if I may, just to, to keep that into context. Uh, you mentioned a scapegoat, uh, that the Pakistan is being seen as an scapegoat. I, I don't think that's how the West and, and people who understand the wider situation would view Pakistan. They would view Pakistan as saying, not that you are to blame for what's happened, but you could be have helped more in making it a success. And that goes back to Lord Salisbury's point about ISI's relationship with the Taliban, about the border being porous enough that the Taliban were able to use the Western territories and so forth to get away. Uh, General Ben Hodges, who was the Afghanistan operations director, has just written a piece uh, in the American media uh, where he pinpoints directly the role of Pakistan, that you were not included uh, in the, the solution in the strategic thinking. Now, that may be our fault, and you are right to point out some of the schoolboy errors that the West made, but we are where we are here today. You've not mentioned India or the geopolitical picture here. I do worry, though, that the, uh, Pakistan did not do enough to actually make this work, that there was too much uh, 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 turning a blind eye, if I may, to Taliban's activities. And I know that you've pushed back a lot of this, but Osama bin Laden was found, you know, in your territory, just up the road from your Sandhurst equivalent. Therefore, you know, we, we take what you say, uh, you know, with interest, but recognize that the picture is far, far more complicated than I think you're spelling out here today. Dr. Yusuf. Can I respond? Please. Sorry, Lord Gordon, I, I can't hear you. Please go ahead. Please that. respond. Thank you. Okay. Th thank you. Um, look, uh, let me just very briefly say, number one, um, helped more. There is a Pakistani version to this. Which other country has done what Pakistan did? Tell me honestly, would Al-Qaeda be wiped out without Pakistan? The US is on record repeatedly saying that without Pakistan, uh, how many uh, uh, you know, uh, efforts we made together to do that. OK. 80,000 casualties, sir. 
which other country would take that for a war next door that we had nothing to do with? Two million internally displaced. Three million plus Afghans still. Tell me how many more refugees is the West willing to take from tomorrow? Please, I, I, I implore you, this is very insulting for Pakistani minds. I say this in all humility, uh, please think about Pakistani lives. Next, we may have had this conversation two, three weeks ago, but are you really telling me that two trillion dollars, not a bullet practically fired, is surrender, a president that runs away, a army that we were told for years is going to be professional, ready to go, uh, and what happened? We were saying again and again, it is not the kind that it's structured the way it will survive. We offered to train Afghan army brigades. If we were so much thinking of the Taliban, tell me, would we train army brigades to fight um, uh, the Taliban? President Biden most recently says, we built the Afghan army, 300,000 strong, incredibly well equipped, force large in size than many of our NATO allies. We gave them every tool they could need. This wasn't Pakistan. The way things have collapsed should tell you that no matter what anybody did, there was a structural problem. An effort was being made, a bubble was created, everybody was convinced a miracle is happening, the ground situation was different, let's please learn lessons. I'm not here for any blame game. Let me just say this much. The UK and Pakistan have a historic opportunity to work together, to ensure that the mistake of the 90s are not made, to engage whatever setup comes about so that they can remain inclusive and moderate and the average Afghan doesn't suffer. And Pakistan is not looked at as a free for all uh, staging ground for uh, anybody who leaves. The final point I want to make, porous border. Yes, it's been a huge problem for us, not for anybody else, for us because we were taking the blame. I've just recounted for you six things that we had concretely put in terms of policy and a fence that we've put there, who was opposing it? The Afghan government. Who was telling the Afghan government uh, that this should not happen this way? Those who were supporting the Afghan government. So why blame Pakistan? Please look at where it was the opposition was. It was in Kabul, not in Pakistan. Thank you. Nusrat Ghani, MP former minister, senior fellow here at Policy Exchange. Nusrat, can you hear me? I can hear you, Dean. Can you hear me? Loud and clear. Thank you. Your question, please. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Yusuf, for giving us your time today and giving us a robust representation of events from Pakistan's perspective. Um, there's no denying that we can't allow Pakistan to pick up to pieces because there is so much to do. But having said that, you mentioned um, a humanitarian crisis, an economic crisis, and a security crisis, and also your confidence that the Taliban will have in place an inclusive government. What leverage do you think that you have above and beyond the West to ensure that one crisis doesn't follow after another? You've also talked about the, the huge generosity you've shown to refugees in the past, there is some anxiety that you may now stop pushing back on the support that you can give Afghans, the average Afghan, the Afghan on the ground that has already paid a huge price and they will continue to pay a price if Pakistan does not welcome them over um, the border. And finally, if I may, it, with, with humility and huge respect to, to Dr. Yusuf, you've mentioned what's happened in the past is in the past. Um, and in particular, I reflect on your exclusion in, in Doha. But having said that, your actions now going forward will speak far more than anything in the past. And I think that perhaps a more realistic interpretation of the ISI's involvement in the Taliban will help progress relationships going forward. Talk to you. Um, on the crisis, I think the script is very clear. There is an easy path, which is a repeat of the 90s. Those who were involved for 20 years in Afghanistan basically turn their back and say, 
This is not for us anymore. Thank you very much. That will create a governance crisis, which will lead to a humanitarian crisis, which will lead to a refugee crisis, which will lead to a security vacuum, and the results will be seen 5, 10, 15 years down the line. There's a more difficult path. The path is difficult because it's politically difficult for uh, the countries that were involved. It is difficult because one would have to acknowledge that it was an internal failure in the policy of Afghanistan that has caused what, uh, where we are today. But that path means engagement. That path means I'm not confident of what the Taliban will do or not do. That's not for me to decide. That's for all those who are engaged to figure out. And the way to do that is to coordinate a consensus. Our foreign minister is right now touring all immediate neighbors of Afghanistan to create a consensus. We hope that the Western world will get included in that consensus on how to keep the government inclusive, how to ensure moderation and human rights, and then how to assist to ensure that a country runs and the average Afghan does not suffer. Now, if we are not going to do that, to be brutally blunt, what we are saying is we only care about the 20, 30, 40,000 Afghans who were associated with us, and the rest of them, good luck. That would be very unfair. History will judge us very, very poorly if that happens. If today uh, uh, the West abandons Afghanistan, the result is known. I don't think we need any uh, mental genius for this. And if we are going to walk away despite that, then I'm afraid there are going to be questions uh, asked about our sincerity uh, for the average Afghan. On the refugees, ma'am, uh, with, with respect again, why is it taken for granted that there will be refugees? That's the first thing. I, I've said it, that we need to avoid that. Nobody wants to leave their country under distress and under duress. We need to avoid that. Even if there is going to be a refugee issue, we should, the international community should work together to create internal um, secure zones in Afghanistan in the bordering regions so that the Afghans don't have to leave their country uh, until the situation stabilizes. But when you say that Pakistan will pull back the support, may I also ask what the rest of the world is willing to do uh, to take up any displacement that happens from Afghanistan? May I also uh, point to the fact that Pakistan got economic distortions, a Kalashnikov culture, drugs in our country because of this flow? Is it not the responsibility of the international community to support Pakistan's view that we need to ensure a dignified return? Other countries also need to share the burden, have an international plan. Right now, everybody is just passing the buck. We need an international plan immediately. And Pakistan will support uh, whatever we can. But please don't see us uh, as the only country that somehow um, it, it has to do this. We don't have the capacity. Our people cannot deal with this. We can barely deal with our own education and hospital um, uh, requirements. We are a country of 220 million. Please uh, also understand our perspective on this. We are willing to support. But the world has to take this responsibility. Uh, and first of all, we need to ensure there are no refugees. Way forward, I've answered, I think it is where we go, but it has to be direct engagement with the Taliban. Don't look at Pakistan, because our leverage is what a neighbor's leverage is. We don't want instability, we don't want protracted conflict, so we'll do whatever we can to avoid that. But the real leverage is with countries who are going to provide foreign assistance, who are going to recognize or not recognize. We have to do that together. The West has more leverage today, I would argue, uh, than us. And finally, I can't resist saying, we can have whatever conversation we want about Pakistan. I, I have no problem with that. But the starting point has to be lessons learned on what happened, uh, why Afghanistan has gone in the way it has gone in the last three weeks. And why the 90s, we said we won't make that mistake. Why is the average Afghan on the ground asking whether the same mistake is being made again? That's the starting point. I'm open to any conversation, but I will repeat. There was one country that was telling the hard truth for 20 years. Nobody listened. The result is in front of us. Let's not blame the victim. Pakistan has suffered because of this war. Thank you. Tom Tugentart, MP, Chair of the Commons Foreign Affairs Select Committee. Tom, can you hear me? Dr. Yusuf, look, thank you very much indeed for your uh, perspective. It's extremely welcome to hear a Pakistani voice on this. 
May I ask, given your uh, many years of experience and in fact your, your recent work as well as the National Security Advisor, what is your assessment on the changing uh, influences and the changing pressures on your country of the uh, Taliban victory in Afghanistan? I ask this because, of course, you've mentioned quite correctly not just the refugees in your country, but also the fact that uh, the federal administered tribal areas, and in fact, wider than that, there are many Pathan communities in the west of your nation that have a much closer relationship with Kabul or Kandahar than they do in some ways with Karachi or Islamabad. And we know as well that the government of Afghanistan, at least up until a few days ago, did not accept the border between your two nations and described it as a temporary Durand line uh, uh, response to a, to a different time. These, of course, will put pressures on your country in order to make sure that these do not spread instability. What assessment have you made of that? And what assessment have you also made of China's increasing influence in terms of seeking out um, copper rights and so on inside the country, while at the same time the Taliban is still hosting the East Turkmenistan Islamic movement, which, as you know, uh, was responsible for some attacks in Xinjiang and was then used as the excuse for the crackdown incarceration and uh, mass uh, abuse of Uyghur Muslims in the west of China. Thank you. Just because we do have a lot of questions, a lot of people want to come in. I just notice uh, Khaled Mahmood, um, Labour MP for Birmingham, Barry Barr, also senior fellow here. Khaled, just uh, sorry to restrict it to quick questions for and for all subsequent questions. Khaled. Well, just very quickly, I think Tom Tugendhat, a very good friend of mine, is also uh, uh, covered most of the parts, and uh, Dr. Mohit, thank you very much uh, for taking this opportunity to come across to us. It's really important to hear the voice uh, of Pakistan in the present circumstances. I know that you've been involved, Pakistan's been involved for a very long time. My issue is, first of all, uh, that very quickly I mentioned on the debate that we had last Wednesday, uh, which is clearly about the status of the people coming over, the refugees that were coming over in droves uh, into Pakistan, how that you need to support international support to, to, to actually look at, at resolving that at source where you are without those people having to come through uh, all sorts of crossing through Pakistan and through other areas uh, and some ending up in de uh, to, to, to their deaths uh, in relation to that and that fact that you need support and aid in relation to that. And, and secondly, uh, how will you manage that? Will you share your intelligence? Will you share all the information openly and transparently uh, with the donors who are prepared to do that? And secondly, you haven't answered the question on India. Uh, and I think some of the issues that, that, that may affect you uh, in relation to the role that you think India has been involved in uh, in Afghanistan, as well as uh, sort of the uh, in the region, the neighbors in the region uh, in negating that. And thirdly, and very finally, a lot of the questions been in relation to the ISI services uh, and whether that will be now completely transparent in the negotiations and discussions you have on the way, way forward. Do you want to go ahead, Dr. Dills? Thank you. Uh, try to be brief. I mean, refugees, I think Tom mentioned it and, and um, the worthy MPs also mentioned it. Look, I want to repeat. It is, why are we talking about refugees and refugee crisis as inevitable? I think the question is, how do we prevent it from happening? And the way to do that is governance and some stability and peace in Afghanistan where refugees don't get created in the first place. So, you know, I think there is a step we are missing here, which is the step that every uh, Afghan would want. It's a self-respecting nation. It's a courageous nation. They would not want to be refugees anywhere else. Um, the ones who are here in Pakistan, we have been saying dignified return for a reason. So we must avoid that. Second, again, my point is, why is this conversation so taken for granted that, of course, Pakistan will do this, and if Pakistan doesn't, oh, it's bad on Pakistan. It's an international responsibility. We are saying, let's prevent this from happening. Second, it's tied to the other point uh, made uh, uh, by Tom. I'm glad you raised this issue of the interconnectedness of the border regions. That's the complicating factor. 
We have such interconnectedness, and you know, frankly, this issue of Buran Line is, is made up. I mean, the entire world uh, accepts it as an international border, but it's porous. And the Afghan side does not agree that we should have a formal visa regime and only those people should cross who have visas. So people come and go. And it's a huge problem. And that's why we keep saying there is more and more pressure in the society in Pakistan uh, dealing with this problem. And we cannot afford a protracted conflict with more people uh, spilling over. Please understand, this is a national existential issue for Pakistan. Others sitting 5,000, 10,000 miles away are talking about one refugee and 10 refugees, and we see the debate in the West. I'm sorry to say, you have, everybody has every right, sovereign countries and regions, but please accept that we've generously taken 3 million, and there is debate over 10 more or 20 more in the West. Um, and so, yes, these are all linked. These are complicated. That's why we keep saying, separate the two. Formal visa regime, Afghans remain where they are, create secure zones if needed for internal displacement, temporary. And if you have an issue, again, an issue is raised about ISI again and again, uh, how much transparency do you want? $2 trillion in Afghanistan, forces in Afghanistan, close collaboration with uh, Pakistan throughout. What other uh, country would allow this? And still the result is 80,000 casualties in our country. You know, we need to drop this talking point. Uh, there is, the Taliban have a whole country under them. What safe haven are we talking about? Their entire country is under them. Why would they need any other territory? Right now, we need to step up to the plate and start this conversation. Somebody earlier mentioned General Carter. I'm not at all saying he's representing the political side. I'm saying in an interview, he clearly said what he said. Uh, that's all I'm saying. They recognize over 20 years Afghanistan has evolved, uh, et cetera, et cetera. So my point being, I'm only relaying to you that there is an opportunity here. If we are going to just continue harping on a point that is unproven, that is illogical and baseless, it does not bode well for the future. And right now, the only conversation should be about where we go in the future. On China, um, Look, there is, a, there is a contradiction in terms here. On the one hand, we are, we are not seeing a clear stance on what's the future in terms of the countries who were there for 20 years. Where do they want to go with this? Uh, are they going to engage? Are they, uh, how are they going to engage? What terms, et cetera? On the other hand, we say China's influence is growing. If a vacuum is left, other countries will fill it. And of course, China is the most powerful country in the neighborhood, and they will fill it if, if that vacuum is left. So that's a decision the Western world needs to make. But we can't say we are not going to engage, but China's influence should not increase. That's, that's I think, an oxymoron. Um, finally, on India, you know, I mean, again, I'm not here uh, to blame anybody, but I just very plainly give you Pakistan's uh, data-based perspective. We have put out dossiers from last year uh, cataloging Indian use of Afghan soil to create terrorism uh, and destabilize Pakistan. India for 20 years has invested in Afghanistan primarily to undercut Pakistan. Look at the places they've, uh, they've invested, uh, the media that they turned against Pakistan by putting millions of dollars into that was not service to the uh, Afghan nation. And the narrative they managed to create was, oh, Pakistan, the problem. What happened? Everybody took their eye off the ball of what was happening within Afghanistan, the corruption, the governance failure, the lack of legitimacy, uh, the fact that the army was not ready to fight, and the end result is that the entire world is embarrassed. If what Pakistan was saying would have been heard, today we wouldn't have been where we are. And overall, last word I would say on, on this um, India issue, everybody who is willing to close their eyes to the ideology that is being spread by the government of India domestically, the expansionist behavior in the region, every neighbor of India has a problem with India today, we will be doing it at our own peril. There is a storm in the making, and the way India is going, even those who partner with India today will be left uh, embarrassed and stunned, just like we've been in Afghanistan. Let me leave it at that. Thank you. I'm afraid we're out of time now for further questions. I want to thank everyone for coming in and say gladly if there's anyone whom we've not been able to accommodate to uh, pass your questions on for response, particularly also from uh, anyone in media organizations. Again, Policy Exchange always likes to be at the forefront of discussing uh, the great issues of the day in timely uh, fashion. And uh, we're very grateful to Dr. Yusuf for coming in today.
for giving uh, Pakistan's perspective here and uh, look forward to welcoming you all back soon. This will be not the last that you've heard from us uh, on this and uh, look forward to welcoming you back uh, in the very near future. Thank you. Goodbye. Thank you very much.